to you before a little formally, but if you could just kind of describe in your own words what uh, you do and kind of what you're up to these days, that would be great. I really appreciate it. So I'm Ian Daw. I'm, I'm the program chief and the medical director of the mental health program here at Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga. Um, and most of my activities uh, right now have been focused around that. I'm, you know, I'm a clinician, a psychiatrist. I actively engage in clinical practice. Um, so I'm seeing lots of people working in the emergency department, working in our ambulatory outpatient clinics, supporting a broad range of people. I think I'm, I'm fortunate as, as the physician leader to be able to drop into selected clinics where there perhaps is most need or most urgency. Uh, you know, if there's a, a bigger wait list in this area, I can go there and help out. Or if there's uh, a sick call or a lack of uh, human resources available over there, I can go there too. So I've got a lot of uh, flexibility to my role, but um, being a clinician, and actively providing mental health services. That's why I got into this job. Uh, that's a big part of the role, perhaps uh, at least 45%. The administrative aspects of running the program, managing uh, the 50 odd psychiatrists that we have working at Trillium Health Partners, uh, the scheduling, the hiring, the onboarding process, uh, just the day to day, uh, physician hospital relationships, the contractual stuff. That's a big part of it. Um, I don't know if I'd put a percentage on it, but maybe <laughs> 20% there. And the remaining 30 ish percent, uh, is, is kind of in the, in the visioning. Um, and you know, as a, as a healthcare leader, you never get to spend as much time as you want in terms of imagining the art of the possible. But there's a, there's a big part of this role in the current state of the pandemic and the stresses on the system and all the stuff that we'll get to talk about, I imagine, in a, in a little bit, has created lots of innovation opportunities. So, you know, by way of a backstory, you know, I, I came to Trillium in 2015, so four and a half years ago. Um, and wanted to really um, go with the opportunity that the senior team and the board of directors provided me, which was to create in Peel region, uh, a new kind of mental health care for a healthier community. Um, and that's, that's a modification of the organization's tagline, which is a new kind of health care for a healthier community we're wanting to be the mental health uh, version of that. So creating new services, new systems, new processes, that's, that's what uh, fleshes out the rest of my week. Wow, cool. And I, I think, can you speak to maybe, I saw like you used to be at Ontario Shores, is that where you were before? Yeah, so prior to coming here to Trillium, um, I was the chief of staff of the, um, the mental health hospital at Ontario Shores, which is in Whitby. Now, ironically enough, uh, in both of those jobs, and even the one before that, I've always lived in Oakville on the <laughs> West End. Uh, but that five years that I was commuting out to Whitby um, was because that was an awesome job and an awesome opportunity to truly be working with a board of directors, working at an entire hospital level at a provincial uh, role of mental health service delivery. This current role, and, and I you know, finished my five years there and then was headhunted to come out here to Trillium. This current role is actually the first time uh, where I've essentially lived and worked in the same community. Um, so not that I'm at all um, thinking that those previous gigs was, uh, you know, just kind of putting in time. But this one feels like there's an ownership stake um, because like, this is my hospital. This is, this is where my family comes. I, and I don't mean that again, from a personal standpoint, sure. but as one of the population of Mississauga, um, it really speaks to the, um, the urgency and the need 
to build the best world, world-class healthcare system. Um, so this one, maybe it's a maturity thing and a career stage thing <laughs> that I can take everything that I learned in my previous roles and apply them here. Um, but there's a, there's a tremendous sense of uh, responsibility now for this, for this job. Yeah, I bet I, I have a little, I have a personal admiration for Ontario Shores. My brother was there for six months in the long-term care. He lives with schizophrenia and that was in 2011, 12. So I'm yeah. sure I, yeah. that would have been my time there. Yeah. Yeah. So I know there's all the privacy stuff. And who knows if he ever came across his path, but that was incredibly helpful for him. Like that was the end of a 10 year, you know, journey for our family and for him. And and that long stay was incredibly helpful for him. So I have a, a soft spot for Ontario Shores for sure. Me too. Uh, and, and I'm pleased to hear that you had, your family had that great experience, not just because I was there, but uh, yeah, people deserve to have good experiences, but you raised a really I think interesting and relevant point that often to get to that level of intensive service, people can have these 10 year journeys uh, of yeah. frustration and sadness and, um, and, 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 and now I've moved a little bit upscale in, in that timeline, trying to, to create the system so that, um, the next group of people don't have a 10 year journey so that they can right, have a yeah. softer <laughs> system flow that works better. Uh, that not that there's, uh, we don't want to take Ontario shores out of the job, uh, no. but that hopefully more people won't need that level uh, of time because we're able to do things uh, much closer to home. Right. And, and that would, in your mind, does that consist of more like early in intervention stuff and also just having those earlier interventions be more effective and thorough? Like for years, you know, it would be emergency room or even police, you know, get he, he'd get picked up by the police, then it would be emergency room, then it'd be short term stay, then it would be, you know, it just, it's such a, even that North York general, I remember like there was still a smoking room on the floor on the ward, you know, and yeah. like, and so, yeah, I'm just kind of curious, like how, cause it is so complex and difficult. Like certain people just have really complex experiences and others, not so much, but yeah. Like, I don't know yeah. how you kind of think about that. And I, I think it's, yeah. it's all part of it. Um, and part of the Ontario Shores job, I was at, St. Mike's and I ran the psychiatric emergency service there. So I was really, for all of my career um, at various levels, I've always been at that point of access between the community and the hospital-based sector. And I think, you know, when I was graduating and, and uh, when I started my, my career, it was always, like, okay, let's build bigger and more and we'll create, uh, you know, better emergency department and a bigger emergency department. We'll do those mobile crisis teams with the police on, on the, I think quite still correct vision that uh, the police shouldn't be the sole um, emergency provider of people in distress. Um, and that if, if a criminal justice response is what's required, then we've completely missed uh, the, right. the right response to somebody in distress. So we started working with the police and we started working to, to yeah. build outreach teams and mental health services, which is that early intervention piece. Right. right. But now, um, now I'm even thinking a few steps before that. Um, now it's like, okay, perhaps we can intervene better so that people don't need to come to the emergency department at all. You know, practically speaking, um, again, for someone who's worked in emergency departments and, and provided care in them for a long time, they don't mean this in the, the negative way that it might come across, but it's actually the worst place for a person to access mental health services, yeah. right? It's yeah. chaotic. It's 24 hours. There's so many things going on. It's not restful at all. And the notion is get in, get out, move on to the next level of care as much as possible. That is not uh, what people need in a mental health crisis yet and i it's consistent here at trillium as it was at uh, st mike's as it 
Well, Ontario Shores didn't have an emergency department, but but it right. would have been consistent if if it was there. Currently, 99%, you're not kidding, 99% of people access our inpatient units in the general hospital system by coming to the emergency department. Right. That that's that's the point of entry into the system. If you don't have a family doctor, if you don't have community resources, you access care through the hospital-based system via the emergency department. And oftentimes that produces these really, you know, terrible ex- experiences where you are at the worst time in your life to justify coming to the emergency department. And you know, you, you get treated in a way that's not particularly patient or family centric because it's an emergency department and the job is to yeah. get people moving through quickly. It's, it's just, while understandable how it kind of evolved that way, perhaps, it's not the way the system should be. And, and again, that's where we're, we really have the, the platform here at Trillium is to reimagine uh, a, a system of care that's different, that, you know, over the course of a, an entire region, Peel region, or at least South Peel, Mississauga, um, the west part of Toronto, um, how we could do things differently. And, you know, I'm not arrogant enough to say that in my five years, we were, we're going to do everything differently. It's going to be the most amazing place. That's at least a 10 year journey. That's at least um, a generation's uh, activity. But with my colleagues here, I am so honored to be having that conversation and to be pushing those buttons and to be kind of peeling back the layers and going, well, I know it is that way, but should it be that way? You know, can we do something different? What are the innovation opportunities? And yeah, that's, I, I, you know, to my, to my dying breath, I, I'm in this to be a clinician, as I said earlier, but that innovation stuff is what really gets me excited about how do we do better and how do we do better in arms with, as a genuine partnership with our patient and family members. It's not us to tell them what to do. Here's what we're going to do better for you. It's like, okay, you know, tell us, tell us what works and what doesn't work. And, and then let's build that together. Yeah. So it's an attitudinal shift in terms of what true engagement and partnership means. Right. I think, yeah, that's wonderful to hear. And I, what often I'm reminded of hearing from someone like yourself is, you know, the lay person, so to speak, we kind of can get caught up in assumptions that it should be easy or why isn't change happening? And, and, all, and I mean, it, it's really difficult to reorganize a system and to get all these pieces moving and it takes a lot of time. And I think, I mean, my, my paternal grandfather had a lobotomy in the forties mm. or, or, or something, I think it was in the forties or maybe early fifties. Um, and I assume they don't do those anymore, but <laughs> I don't think they do. But like, it just goes to show you, I mean, that was the best that they could do at the time with what they had. And we've come a long way and we still have a long way to go, but just- You're I, right. Um, can you speak a bit to the complexity of like how, cause there's government, there's like all kinds of factors involved, I assume, right? There, there's all kinds of factors. There's all kinds of people. There's all kinds of layers of the system you know, the community sector is funded entirely differently than the hospital-based sector. Um, the provincial psychiatric system and the hospitals like Ontario Shores and CAMH and the Royal right. and Waypoint, they're funded entirely differently. Everybody works with the best of intentions, mm-hmm. but the opportunity to work collectively and as I mentioned before, that's not even considering the need to work in true partnership with patients and families. Right. right. Um, there's just all of these silos and all of these challenges um, to to trying to do better together. Um, easy. You're right. Easy to say. Makes total sense. Uh, it's exactly <laughs> what we all wish for. 
but incredibly complex to actually accomplish given um, the pressure points and, the, and the, the need to provide care and ongoing work while at the same time redesigning it to do better. Right, right. And the hesitation of, well, we, we can't change that yet because it's actually doing this really uh, important aspect of care and we'll have to plan of how to, you know, all of those kind of things. Right. It, it, it's an inordinate amount of complexity. Yeah. People always talk about, you know, is it rocket science? Well, no, it's not rocket science, <laughs> but it's pretty, pretty darn complex. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Wow. Um, maybe so that kind of maybe can get into a little bit of the first real topic that I was kind of curious about how, so there's all that complexity in the background. Then we have this pandemic and that sort of has, you also mentioned kind of there's opportunities some ways to innovate and to change care models, I guess, or there's a necessity to, um, how, how has that perhaps impacted Trillium and the hospitals that you're working in and it's a, impacts on young people, old people, families, all that kind of stuff. Like how are people accessing care and, and what is that looking like right now? So, you know, the pandemic um, has dramatically affected uh, people's access to the services and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk through that a little bit. Because there's a lot of confusing terms, a lot of um, similar sounding phrases to how we think about um, the various waves of the pandemic and where we are. You know, from the hospitals based perspective, wait, there is wave one, which we kind of had um, during that first few months of the pandemic, February, March, April, May we're deep into wave two now. But there's also a different way of looking at each of those individual waves, you know, subcategories of waves. And that speaks to the impact that it's made on our populations broadly, as well as uh, the mental health program specifically and the patients who access it. To manage the, the intense amount of COVID-19 presentations, uh, in wave one, and you know we're kind of going through that again now in wave two, the hospital really pivoted so much of res its resources to manage the immediate sickness, the mortality, and the morbidity of the infection itself. So in order to free up resources to manage the number of people who were coming in with the virus, who needed ventilation and ICU level, we had to make very difficult decisions about shutting down other aspects of the program or pausing other sorts. No elective surgeries, for example. No non-urgent level uh, of care otherwise. So, so a lot of the, and I say this with air quotes, a lot of the routine-based care, it's not routine to the person who's actually needed. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the non-explicitly urgent or emergent levels of care was paused. Uh, and people like physicians, clinicians, nursing and allied staff, administrators were all redeployed to be at the front door to actually meet the needs of uh, people who were presenting at the doorsteps sick with COVID. Then secondary to that, there was the explosion of COVID cases in the long-term care homes and in the retirement homes in that sector. And then our hospital-based resources were tapped again to actually go into the long-term care homes. And in some respects, in some of our homes at Trillium, explicitly take over the leadership and the day-to-day -day operations to shore up that level of care to provide um, the necessity of, of managing what was happening there. Incredibly tragic uh, circumstances. And we were honored and pleased to play a role in it. But all of that was to say that that took us away from the core business of day-to-day -day patient care. 
our volumes coming to the emergency department for non-COVID related issues fell precipitously. You know, there, there was um, the people who were in the emergency department were, were COVID sick, but the people who were sick in the community for all of the other reasons didn't come to the emergency department. They, they often didn't come to primary care or other community-based things because everybody was shutting down. Um, and that creates burdens of care and increasing illness in the community itself. Right. Yeah. While none of us had lived through COVID pandemic, a worldwide pandemic before, we were able to look at the lessons learned, you know, with the Spanish flu in, in the 20, uh, 1917 through 1919. We were able to look at, you know, the Ebola kind of circumstances, the previous SARS issues, even disasters like the uh, the wildfires in Alberta a number of years ago, to see what the impact of disasters and pandemics or epidemics is on the system. And what we see is, yeah, resources pivot to try to deal with the immediacy of it, but that comes at a cost for non-COVID there was an internet disruption, we bring you right back to the conversation. My apologies. Okay, so thanks for, for that uh, repivot. Uh, yeah. So we were able to learn by previous pandemics and previous ex experiences of disasters on, on what happens. And, and what happens is yeah. just like what we were dealing with, you pivot all the resources to meet the immediate need, but that's at the cost of the chronic need. Um, and the chronic need, unfortunately, is often where the mental health kind of group is. So that was a group of people that if they weren't urgent and emergent, weren't getting the day-to-day -day care that they require here at Trillium, in Toronto, in, Kix in Kingston, in Vancouver, in, in, you know, across the world. And as that goes on, that those, the impacts of the resource restrictions and the ongoing uh, sickness really starts to increase. So now uh, the, the implications of that on the mental health population, they're kind of long-term and they're complex. Because of society's initial response, there is a group of other uh, families and patients Whose, whose conditions have actually gotten worse over time because of the, the, the hard decisions that had to be made to cope with the, the pandemic itself. Those decisions needed to be made. Those, those were, were people that were dying at the front doorstep and they were incredibly difficult and, and within the organizations, not just at our own, but um, across the world, you, you saw um, what people called the moral injury of healthcare workers. You know, how do you, how do you actually stop doing this, which is so important and pivot over to doing that, knowing that that's actually gonna impact negatively on, on the other folks. Incredibly difficult decisions. And so now, you know, deep into wave two, we're learning about how we did it the first time and not wanting to necessarily just think about stopping and starting, but how do we do and with, how do we do all of it together um, so that people aren't disadvantaged. Um, but, you know, throughout that entire process, I, I'm not going to, to, to try to sugarcoat it. We're still in that situation. Like every, I think hospital in, in Ontario, where we're still only seeing the urgent uh, or emergent case. We're not doing uh, the day-to-day -day kind of work that many people expect and want us to do as, as you know, one of the dominant healthcare organizations in our community and people needed us to do. Um, we're, we're in this kind of strange situation of how do we try to do all of it uh, or partner with other organizations to do it differently so that uh, people aren't being disadvantaged. And, and then 
the I wouldn't be a mental health care leader if I didn't talk about at least funding at some point in time. All of that takes place in the context of mental health being the least funded uh, or the second least funded um, part of our healthcare system. You know, it, there are just historic inequities about the amount of funding and resources that are placed on, uh, on mental health relative to other uh, aspects of, of our healthcare system. And, and this isn't a competition between, you know, why does cancer get so much money or how come infectious disease gets so much money and mental health doesn't get anything or relatively little. Um, but there's that kind of lens on the system too. Like mental health was always resource stretched. And now with, with COVID and, and the implications of COVID, your question is a very timely one. It's how does a system that was already struggling to meet the needs of, of the demand in our population um, cope with that much more demand coming forward? You know, and, and you think about what COVID did for people in the population, job loss, isolation, financial stress, food insecurity, uh, all of the things that people historically based their resiliency on, their identities, their jobs, their circumstances, their family situations, their community engagement, now all of a sudden was, was jeopardized. Um, it, it, was, it was a kind of a perfect storm in a lot of situations. All right, I'm curious what your thoughts on like, I think one aspect maybe of why it's so difficult for funding models, et cetera, all the numbers that governments play with in terms of funding mental health care is it's in some sense like the subjectivity of people's well being is not necessarily quantifiable. So, so then it's almost like we give ourselves a pass on addressing it because we can kind of shove it to the side in some sense. And like, I, I love the, I mean, I'm a mindfulness person too, but I think ACT, like acceptance and commitment therapy describes the difference between the thinking, you know, rational mind and the observing kind of watching mind and how that rational need for linear thinking works backwards when it comes to our emotions and our, and our well-being. And I wonder if maybe it's a stretch, but like, is that, do you think some part of like our collective inability to direct resources to, to mental health needs? I think that's certainly part of it. Uh, you know, and mental health for centuries has always kind of been uh, debating within its own ranks, the whole concept of is, is the art and the science of medicine. And one of the really positive aspects of the science aspect of that argument is the measurement piece, is the notion that if you can make explicit uh, and quantifiable the um, both the level of suffering that people have and then the effectiveness of the treatments that you bring to it, and you can, you can then illustrate cause and effect and, and that, you know, for, for the dollar invested, you save all kinds of dollars uh, down the road. Right, right, right. No. The, the economic argument, uh, I think, has always been uh, not as well articulated in mental health. Not that it doesn't deserve to be made, nor can be made, but it's only now, I think, that the data is being made available and, and highly trained econ economic uh, indicators can be brought to bear to help uh, service that need. Right. That right. we're able to make those arguments now um, that are more than just um, pleading um, for for more. Uh, now we can we can demonstrably demonstrate. Here's the need. Here's the actual impact. Here's the the circumstances that need to change. Here's the cost effective piece of what to do about it. And here's the savings to the to society as a whole. Um, 
but you're right. It, it gets into that the tension points between um, reactive care and proactive care. And you know, if if we're able to kind of take away um, from the reactive part of the pie, spending money after people have already gotten sick to starting to spend and invest to keep people from getting sick in the first place. That's the kind of golden uh, notion of how we can actually do better is, yeah. you know, is how do I make people not need me um, five years from now or 10 years mm -hmm. from now? Not that, you know, I don't want to keep doing this job, but sure. one of the best things I can think of in terms of the health of the population is that they don't need to come to the emergency department, um, that they have either other access points that are better to the system or that they're better overall in terms of their wellness and they don't have to access uh, you know, me or my colleagues. That, that's kind of my dream is, is um, I'll find something else to do, quite frankly. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, if I can work myself out of a job because we've actually created a better system, that's that's that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Um, that's actually perfect for um, a question I wanted to ask you about. Like psychiatry, you're a psychiatrist, and also um perhaps like medical medical doctor psychotherapists mm -hmm. so um when i first started getting well i guess when i sobered up and i got on a wait list for a medical clinic that provides psychotherapy so they're mds yeah and and that took a while to get that wait list took a while but i finally got in there and my therapist was fantastic. And I saw him for a really long time. And then he retired, unfortunately. And now I see a psychiatrist, actually, who's at the same clinic. But he also provides psychotherapy, which is quite rare, I think, nowadays for psychiatrists yeah. to sit there for an hour with you. And so I also have a, a I guess I go to group psychotherapy. It's a mindfulness program mm -hmm. that a, like a, an MD psychotherapist provides through OHIP, which is incredible. And like, so the, the health benefits of those things are, are astronomical. Like you said, it's health promotion too, in some sense. And there seems to be a big resistance to the government. I guess, I guess I don't want to lay, but how do we <laughs> allow more doctors or more government provided care um, for psychotherapy type things. And also like, was it ever a psychiatrist role in some sense to be providing psychotherapy and how did that like fall apart? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot in there. Yeah. There's, <laughs> and you're right. Um, so I guess by way of context, I personally, um, I've never believed that a psychiatrist should only be uh, a, a provider of prescription-based medication. Right. I yeah. think, again, this is my personal opinion, not, not my uh, leadership position, but yeah. I, it's probably not a surprise that one does influence the other. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when I practice, I think about, yeah, okay, medication is about 30% of, of uh, the, the effectiveness of what I do psychological therapies and um, the psychotherapy aspect of support, that's about 50% of the impact and the long-term effectiveness aspect. And that remaining 20% is in the self-care and the mindfulness and the stress management and the, ins the ensuring of thinking about the broader circumstances that people are dealing with, not so much what's wrong with them, but what's happening yeah. to them and what, what their environment and context has, helping people get to the top of their game. So I think it's really important to, to think about that level, you know, that in fact, I think the historical doctors and, and the one I try to aspire to be is one who's operating comfortably in all three of those domains. 
but there is no question that um, at the end of the 1990s in through the 2000s, that the psychiatry profession became very much about uh, the medical model. Um, you know, the decade of the brain was declared by the National Institute of Health in the US. That there was a real reductionistic move uh, to, um, to solve mental illness. And, and I think a belief that that could be done um, by a pill or by a biological right. intervention. Right. Well-meaning, um, yeah. but hasn't produced nearly the, the results that, uh, uh, that it was hoped to. And I think any uh, realistic appraisal of the benefits of medication has to also be seen through the lens of the drawbacks of medication, the noxious side effects, the challenges that uh, they have. It's not the be-all and end-all of things. In fact, it rarely is the be-all and end-all of things. Not to say that again, certain life-saving medications can be yeah. incredibly important. I'm not kind of no for sure. Them, yeah, but it's about seeing it in balance. Anyway, so there's there's all that context. Doctors then kind of I think became um, you know really focused on the biology of things, and there was a belief that other professionals would be available to do the psychological aspects. Psychologists, oh, yeah, okay. social workers, occupational therapists, um, now physician assistants and nurse practitioners and, and a whole array of mental health teams. And we would all come together in an interprofessional sense to right. um, provide the unique aspects of our training and background so that a person could benefit from all of it. Well, that's great on paper. And uh, again, I, I love the notion of an interprofessional team and all of those kind of things. Problem with that in Canada, at least, is that only one of those team members is funded by the public mental health system, the doctor. Uh, right. So that, you know, if you want to have access to a psychologist, you got to pay out of pocket for that, um, historically. If you wanted access to a social worker in the community or another psychotherapist in the community, you were paying directly for those services. And that creates inequity and it creates barriers to care and it creates multiple layers of uh, unfairness in the system. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. huge demand and huge wait lists uh, for the publicly available um, dollars that rarely existed. Um, and you know, that, that was in the 1990s and 2000s and, and we're still living, you know, some of those wait lists and some of those policy decisions that were made. Um, and now in current level, the pandemic has, uh, produced some real innovative opportunities. So publicly funded psychotherapy, um, is now available again. Uh, to everybody who's in Ontario. It, it might be digitally delivered because of, you know, the, the aspects of the pandemic. And uh, yeah. it's, it's evolving to be much right. more of a partnership-based approach where, you know, some of it, some of the material can be delivered uh, electronically and through virtual platforms the person and family does a lot of work and then brings back that information to the next session. So it's not just an hour a week. There's an hour a week of kind of the, the coaching, but the work is being done in the other five to six days of the week as well. That's a tremendous um, new opportunity, publicly funded psychotherapy in Ontario for the first time in 30 years. It's happening this year. That's, that's amazing. We're, we're, mm. uh, we're so thankful and appreciative of uh, that type of funding. You know, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's, yeah. it's a particular yeah. model of therapy. It's not um, you know, any type of psychological therapy, but we're able to use innovation um, to, to try to, think about the person's journey differently. 
you know, they might see me as the team captain. I can help design a pathway that says, okay, you're going to see me once every couple of months and here's the value add of the medication piece of it, if any. You're going to see this practitioner for the psychotherapy aspects and you're going to work, you know, in this digital platform. And we're going to start bringing apps and technology-based support to, uh, to your care so that you can be doing mindfulness or act-based acceptance treatments in your home yeah. at a time and place of your convenience. So there's lots of new opportunities mm-hmm. and new innovations, which I think, even though it's a pandemic and it's in fact a, a resource <laughs> restricted environment, actually some really cool thinking is taking place about reimagining new ways of doing things. Yeah. Wow. That's, I was getting super excited and I, part of me wants to hold you hostage for the next five hours and just pick your brain about all this stuff. <laughs> I, I Maybe, talk about this so, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's so nice to hear you. I mean, one thing when you're talking about the COVID impact, I was just almost, it was like being soothed because we get, we get lost in thinking, why isn't this happening? Why isn't this happening? But hearing it from you, like just how difficult it is on the ground when people are showing up and you got all these things to rearranging the deck chairs and it's just a huge, complex, difficult thing. And and the system and people are doing their best. Absolutely. So it was nice to hear you say that. Yeah. And and, and I don't say this just because it was my experience. I think it was probably experience many people across Ontario, but I, in March, when wave one was happening, I, ha- I got retrained to be a ICU capable medical doctor. <laughs> right. I had to go back to school, so to speak, to relearn yeah. how to turn on a ventilator and how to do that level of care. It had nothing to do with my mental health experience, yeah. but we needed people to literally, okay, stop doing that we got to have you over here because we just don't have enough people to keep the lights on with the amount of ICU level sickness we have. That's, you know, that's a story we're both incredibly proud of and horrified about at the same time. Yeah. Because, you know, that, that is, it's terrible to have to make that type of decision-making about um, where the resources need to go at any one time. That is the true uh, travesty of what, of, of what a pandemic is. It's, you know, and I think all aspects of society are, are still dealing with the ramifications of that. And now the fear that it's, it's happening all over again. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. I think I, I, I know you're a busy man and we didn't get to talk too much about the CAMS care stuff, but do you want to just say quickly about, you know, you, you started the first, or the THP yeah. started the first uh, clinic doing this in Canada, I think. It speaks, and, yeah. it speaks to what kind of hint that I dropped a little a bit ago about that whole reactive versus proactive care. Um, my, my clinical passion has been in my training and the circumstances that I've tended to get involved in has been in suicide and suicide prevention. I guess anti-suicide, I should say, not, not suicide. <laughs> uh, but it, but it's the notion of my intense dissatisfaction that in Canada the rate of suicide uh, hasn't changed appreciably in 25 years that we've been keeping track. Every single year, it's 4,000 people who take their lives and die a death of despair. Um, despite all of the approaches that we've talked about, despite new medications, despite new therapies, despite that. And I've always felt we need to do something different. Like that is a tragedy and a public health emergency that happens and it just continues to happen. Um, And somebody's got to stand up and say enough. We need to do something different. And if in mental health, if we can't band around the worst outcome imaginable uh, for a mental health condition and say that rate is unacceptable, we got to do something different, then 
you know, why are we doing this? Hmm. Now, I know we're doing this for lots of other reasons, but for sure. you know, if we can't agree on the worst possible outcome being the thing that we need to, to step back from. Um, so part of my motivation as a leader has been to, to think about that is let's, let's work backwards from the worst possible outcome and let's examine all of the, the ways that we have tried to um, deal with that in the past learn from that and to do something different. Well, lo and behold, what we've discovered is that suicide is a really complex thing, uh, which is not surprising. Um, it needs to have much more than just a hospital level approach in isolation of that broader community approach and broader uh, aspects. So we've actually started here in Peel region, um, a project called Project Now which is an innovative funded partnership involving the hospital sector, the community mental health sector, the school systems, the police, the mayor's office, uh, all of the civic leadership of the city, all coming together to look at that suicide rate and say, we're gonna do something different. So we've created this project now, we've got funding from government, we've got funding from uh, corporate philanthropy dollars, we've got funding from private philanthropy dollars to reimagine a system that is suicide safe um, and that does things differently. And the key tenant of doing things differently in suicide care is directly dealing with somebody's suicidality. Now that might sound like, what do you mean? Aren't you doing that all the time? In fact, no, historically, people's suicidality was thought to be the consequence of the severity of their illness. So that if we just did depression care much better and got people not depressed, they wouldn't be suicidal anymore. Or if we could do schizophrenia care that much better and they were no longer psychotic, they wouldn't be suicidal. Uh, if we did anxiety care better and people weren't as anxious, they wouldn't want to die by suicide. Well, the rates, again, being consistent for 25 years, say that that doesn't work. What we need to do differently is directly deal with being suicidal, the state of being suicidal, the thoughts of being suicidal, independently and in addition to the mental health concern. Um, so as far as I know, uh, as part of this broader project now, and as part of our commitment to Trillium to do things differently, we've brought forward Canada's first clinic offering services for exactly that. It's called the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality. And it's one of the three evidence-based models in the world. Believe me, we've looked, we've done a <laughs> huge kind of outreach of services around this over the last number of years to try to find out both a systemic level of intervention and then a level of intervention that directly deals with a person being suicidal so that you'll get anti-suicide care that happens in addition to and in parallel with your antidepressant care or your anti-anxiety care or your anti-schizophrenia care. And it's only early days. We, we just did a a soft launch of this in August, using hotel terminology, apparently the soft <laughs> launch versus the hard launch. We've kind of started it um, unofficially in August. And now we, we're, we're up and running as a formal clinic, um, but it's really intriguing. I, I have a lot of enthusiasm for, this is truly doing different. And we will work with people collaboratively that's, that's part of the model. That person is expert. We are knowledge providers and content uh, providers. We come together as equals to do something that neither one of us can do alone, mm. is to build recovery. It's not like we do to you. It's we do together, quite explicitly, quite collaboratively. But that we actually save lives together. Um, so I think it's... It's the true calling uh, of a psychiatrist mm -hmm. is to, to help 
uh, avert that worst case scenario. I am thrilled uh, to have been able to help bring that to Trillium. And the whole basis of our Project Now thing, which is a broader partnership than just, just one clinic. But the notion is if we can do that here in Peel, then we can show the way for any uh, community in Canada uh, to eliminate suicide um, in, in a foreseeable future. So that's, uh, that's not the off the side of the desk activity. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's actually, again, that whole sense of what do we need to do differently? What do we need to do to truly make this a patient-centered system? Recovery, genuine partnerships, engagement with people and family members, not as targets, but as true uh, partners, genuine, not tokenism. Um, and then let's focus on the real things that are going on in people's lives. Again, not with a, what's wrong with them, but a what's happening to them lens uh, that, that helps make things um, responsive and better. Dr. Daw, it's so beautiful. I, I sincerely appreciate your time. I know you got to go. I don't want to hold you one more second. And so thank you so much. And I think that project, I will have to get in touch with you in a few months when you have another extra spare time and, and continue the conversation. But the work you're doing is phenomenal. And you're a role model to many a people like myself. And um, you carry yourself with such grace and ease. It's really wonderful. And so thank you so much. I'm flattered, but just a guy wanting to do better. <laughs> and I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's lovely to be here and delighted to come back at any time. Cool, man. Okay. Well, thank you so much.